Wow. Once a teacher, always a teacher. I'll start with just a few questions, and then after, I'll come to each one of you for an answer. Have you come across a child or children who write, and when they are writing, some letters are written in the, facing the other opposite direction? Talking about letters like B, D, P, you know, they almost look the same, but when they are writing them, they face the other way around. That's one. Two, have you come across these children who appear so bright when you're talking to them, but when it comes to bringing a report card at the end of the term, they are either number last or they are down, down there, and you're not happy about it? Just in case your answer is yes. What have you done to help such a child? Have you tried to find out what the problem could be? Every time we talk about disability, what runs in our minds are the physically disabled, the lame, the blind, children with Down syndrome, autism, you know, those that you can see when you look at them and you know this one has a problem. But today, I am here to talk about dyslexia. Some people have issues pronouncing that word. Today I'm going to pronounce it more and more, but the time we leave this place, you'll be knowing how to say it, dyslexia. dyslexia. This is a learning disability among children that affects the reading, the writing, and the spelling skills of an individual. It is the commonest learning disability. And when I say common, it's, I mean that word. Research has it that out of every five people, one is dyslexic. Do you know what that means? That even if we say it wherever you're seated, you just count, you know, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> one of those people is dyslexic. That is how serious this condition is. We are living with it, we are moving around with it, and we are doing, doing less to help these children. It varies from mild, to moderate, and severe. Meaning that if you're mild, you will move along with it. You, you will not be noticed. You will struggle and somehow make it. But the moderate and the severe ones are the ones we have punished day in, day out. We have beaten them, we have refused to give them food because they didn't perform well. We have punished them now and again. Dyslexia has nothing to do with someone's intelligence levels. And it affects both male and female. So don't say this is for men, so me, I'm out. No. It affects both sexes. And it is common everywhere we go, in schools, in universities. It's not only with children. What causes this condition? We'd want to know. One, in most cases, it is genetical. It moves through families. If you're a parent or a mother with dyslexia, it is more likely that you'll give birth to a child who has that condition. However, the parents may not have this condition, but because our great-grandparents had it, so somehow you find that your child today is struggling with it. So don't start saying, ah, now mine, where did he get it from? Maybe it is my husband. Because now we start pointing fingers. It could also come from way back. How can we tell? Maybe these are some of the questions we have now. How do we tell? if someone is dyslexic. Like I mentioned, you'll note from the letters how they are written, B is pacing the other way around. And even when they are old, they will do it because it is a disability. Uh, in most cases, they are late talkers. You find you have a baby and goes up to five, six years, 
has not said a word. But later they talk. I'm trying to give you pointers to, to notes. They normally take so long to tell left from right. You know, someone goes up to P3, but when they're putting on their shoes, you still wonder, how can you be in P3 and you can't even tell left from right? They are there. You may not have seen them, but they are there. The other pointers are omitting of letters when they are writing. They normally write words, but somehow two or three letters are missing. They always take so long to copy work, whatever given work. It takes them a long time to copy from wherever it is to their books. So this also follows them in examination periods, in doing exercises in class, and this is a situation they are going through for a very long time in case it is not attended to. In my journey with these children, I'll share with you an experience of Peter. Peter is a 12-year-old boy. He's in P6 now, Form 6. And one evening, he comes and tells me, Auntie Hope, I want you to help me. I want to escape from home. Help me escape. And I do not want to come back home. So I asked Peter, what's the problem? Why do you want to escape from home? And his answer was, I am tired of being beaten by my parents, our maid, and sometimes even my uncles whenever I'm doing my homework. And even when I go to school, I'm beaten by teachers for not completing work. I am laughed at by my fellow students because they think I am stupid. I am called all sorts of names, and I don't like it. Yet most of the time I tell teachers I know the answers, but my problem is writing them down. Do you see that problem? This boy is not stupid like he is being called. He has the answers. The problem is putting them down. There are many of us who maybe would want to do particular things, but you fail because somehow there's something that is stopping you from doing that. So this was Peter. Do you know how many other Peters are struggling out there? Can you think about it? Imagine in an exercise of 10 numbers in class, the regular child who we love to call normal will finish the 10 numbers in time and actually have some time to play around. But the dyslexic child will be on number two or number three when the teacher says, correct your books for marking. What happens when they go to mark? All of them are marked out of 10. Can you imagine if Peter was given extra more time to finish his work? Don't you think that would have been better enough? The same happens when they're doing examinations. You're given th three hours, and after three hours, they tell you, pens down, stand up. The dyslexic child is still on page one. And the other ones have finished. But remember, he is not on page one because he does not know. He is trying to impress the teacher by thinking so much, how do I write this? By the time he finishes thinking on the first page, it is time to go, to get out of the room. And what happens when evaluation is being done? Out of 100, everyone will be marked out of 100 even the one who did one page. Do you think that is fair? I think no. All we need is some little bit of patience with these children. Lots of probing, you know? Go to him and say, please, Peter, hurry up. We still have some few minutes to finish. And keep telling him. It is all we need. We need to do self-sensitization. If you are a teacher and you are dealing with such a, a, a child, what is wrong with finding out why this child is behaving like this? Yet when you are discussing, you say, you know, when we are, when we are discussing in class, he, he seems bright. 
but I don't know what happens when examinations come. Why don't you try to find out what actually happens? Maybe that can help. I'll still share with you an experience of a mother. Mothers have issues out there. Marcel has three children, and one of the three is dyslexic. She comes to me saying, I am tired. Rita has repeated three times in P7, in three different schools, but still, Nothing has changed. I've tried to bring people for coaching, they coach her, they give her extra time, but still, the girl has failed. What can I do? Even the sister who is in P2 reads much better than Rita in P7, for three years, remember. Where is the problem? The mother doesn't know. The teachers who are telling that girl to repeat do not know. Can we do an extra sensitization? Can we try to sensitize ourselves when you see such cases? Today, it's, it's Marcia struggling with her daughter. But I don't know how many of you out there are going through the same situation. It could be your auntie's child, your uncle's son, your neighbor's daughter, or even your wife's best friend's child. Yes. Your wife's best friend's child is going through the same. Can we help these children? Here in Uganda, the examination board has a facility for those children, the dyslexic children. They, offer, they, they always send transcribers to schools at final level to help read and write for these children because they know the condition that they go through. But where is the problem? The schools do not know. They only tell these children, repeat, try your talents elsewhere. <laughs> try your talents, you can imagine. Even when you try to tell them, please, you know, there is this facility, uh, let, let this child be helped, at the end of the day, you know, you never send some people to help. They are still adamant because they want to appear in newspapers, with flying colors, the best school in Kampala. And who is suffering? The parent who pays fees for seven years, and at the end of the seven years, they tell you, no, your child cannot sit your examinations from this school. After paying school fees for those years. I don't know if you have seen such cases, but I'm sure, somehow, that you have. How can we help out? This is a call. How can we help these children? How can we set out to be examples and say, even if my child is okay, I can make a difference in this child's life, in the neighbor's child's life? I told you these children are always very intelligent, meaning that if you develop the other talents that they have, they can feel motivated. Because sometimes you find, yes, I can't read, but I can do music. Why not support me? I can do sports. Why not support me? Because when they feel that they can do what they love best, they feel motivated. They feel they belong to a society where they won't say, even if you say, I'm stupid, I'll say, but for me, I can score a goal. For you, you cannot. Okay? And he will be telling the one who is very excellent in exercise, you know, in examinations and whatever. For me, I can do this, so for you, it's okay, continue with that. So let's develop the talents of these children so they can feel motivated and have the will to live instead of saying, help me escape from home. Go where? Where are they supposed to go after getting out of their homes? I will end with the dyslexic bright. I told you that if it is not attended to at an early stage, it grows with us. I happened to be one of the organizing members of this wedding. And the bride and the groom, and well known to me, and very good, and very excellent. When you look at them, you can't think there's a problem. 
So on the wedding day, I happened to be one of the ushers in church. And when I was standing at the entrance of the church with the order of service books and giving out those who were entering, one of the maids comes and says, excuse me, the bride would like to talk to you. So I rushed and reached the bride. The bride tells me, please help me go to the altar and tell the reverend not to ask me to read because I cannot read well. You listen to that? This is someone who would contribute in meetings, speak very good English and interact with so many people. But of course, immediately, I think it was luck that she sent for me. Immediately, I understood that this is dyslexia. So I rushed to the altar. I told the reverend, please, when the groom and the bride come, please let someone read for them, and they repeat on the mic. And then I'll explain to you later why we have to do it like this. And that is what was done. I want you to imagine if this bride got to the altar and then they gave her the book to read and she cannot even say, I, so and so, take you, so and so. Can you imagine what would have happened? Especially look at the side of the, of the groom. <laughs> it is better to understand it in that area. What have you married? What is this? We won't even go to the reception. We cannot take a, ch- a woman who is not educated. You understand? But the problem was solved. And when we reached the reception and uh, she gave her speech, no one would understand that she has this condition. So that's why I said that sometimes we think we are very okay, but we are struggling with some conditions which need help. And it's always very important to seek out for help. And it's even much better if it's, if it's given at the beginning and then we outgrow it. Because I want to assure you that with dyslexia, if you identify it and you give the attention that it requires, individualized lesson planning and attention, it doesn't matter if you're teaching a senior three girl how to read. It is okay. But some people are like, hey, how can I teach you how to read when you are already big? That is wrong. It is all about reading and writing. The rest is okay. So when you find out the problem is there, please attack it immediately. Seek help with those who know. Seek information. And when you, atta- you find out that there is, there is a emotional distress within your child, do not hesitate to seek counseling. Counseling is very important. These people will open up to people who seem to be friendly. Yes, parents are friendly, but sometimes we, we want to punish because we want something specific from this child. Seek counseling and the counselor will come and tell you, you know what? This side, do like this. When it comes to this, do it like this. And the problem will be solved. I want to call upon you to take it upon yourself, each one of us here, to go and make a difference in someone's child. Who has that condition? You could change policy. You could go to schools and tell these head teachers that this is workable. Don't throw this child out of the school. And before long, we shall put smiles on these faces of the dyslexic children. Because we need those smiles. They are very important. My passion in life is to set up a hope center. Where are those children with the, with the non-noticed learning disabilities can feel accepted and well taken care of as they rightfully deserve? Each one of us can be a star. I thank you.